February 9th. February the 9th. 1983. 83, yes, sir. And this is Joe Todd, interview with Bernie A. Niles. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mr. Niles, where were you born? Uh, at Niles, Oklahoma. Uh, When's your birthday? June the 30th. 1909. 1909. Uh huh. Hmm. Who is your father? Van A. Niles. He's from Oklahoma? Uh, he was born in Kansas. He came down there with his grandfather in the run. How old was he when they made the run? Well, I don't really know. You, uh, they took him out of third grade to come down here and run, and that's all the schooling he ever got. <laughs> so uh, he would have probably been nine or ten years old. Yeah. And who was your mother? Marjorie R. Yeah. What was her maiden name? Holy. Oh. Now that makes you study. Her mother was married to Fulton, and he got killed in the Spanish-American War, and then she turned around and married to Foley. And a lot of people think you're not even you're not separating it, or you're mispronouncing it one way or the other. Sometimes Folsom, when you talk. Is that any relation to the uh, Fultons from the Choctaw? The Choctaw Fultons? I don't know. Uh, there was two Folsoms that I know of. There's uh, Mrs. Uh, Morris that lives just south of me on the corner. Yeah. She and one of one of my uncles, that's Folsom, tried to. Uh, they tried to get connection. Well, they both come from the same part of the country, Illinois, but they never could get close enough to to prove it as relatives. But. Uh, and you say. That Mr. Folsom was killed in the Spanish-American War. No, uh, yes, yeah, Folsom. Uh huh. Yeah. And then, uh, then she married a Foley and had three children by him. And my mother was a baby of the yeah. last three children. Where was he killed? Was he from Oklahoma, Mr. Folsom? I don't have no. Uh, I would, I would guess that uh, he was around Indiana, but I'm not. My mother was born in Hebron, Indiana. Is reading I'm saying that they was up in that part of the country. Did she ever talk about where he was killed in the war? Well, uh, see, that wasn't her dad. Yeah, right. And uh, no, no, we never did carry on a conversation about it. That's like something else. Uh, she was from Indiana. Yeah, yeah, Hebron, Indiana is where she was born. Um, what's your first memory of Niles, Oklahoma? Oh, uh, we we had a grocery store there, and uh, big water tank and a windmill between the grocery store and, and the house. And uh, of course, at that time they had a big water tank uh, where the people gathered there for groceries and watered their stock. And uh, then after we got away from the grocery store, just moved to the farm and two miles from there. Why? We'd go back to the grocery store after groceries and stuff, and they had an old kerosene lamp in the store. And us little kids, somebody picks us up and let us warm our hands on this by this lamp when it was chilly. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, I lived around the, within two miles, two or three miles of the store till uh, well, I was. Uh, I was born here at 10 when, I, yeah. when we moved over here to El Reno. What was the name of the store? Just the Niles, store? Niles Grocery Store. Who was Niles, Oklahoma named after? My dad. Van A. Niles. Van A. Niles. How big was Niles? <laughs> they, were <laughs> they were just a grocery store, a creamy station, a blacksmith shop, and across on the other corner was a little church. And across west, uh, was a house on the other corner, a big house, 
Abbott's lived there. Now, there's a lady back here right now that lived right in that vicinity. I went to school with her in 1915 through, uh, through 17. We went out, I just went out there two years, and then we moved to town. I mean, yeah, moved to El Reno. Mm -hmm. He ran the black hat shop. Uh, at one time, my dad, uh, a guy by the name of Mr. Sparks, had it at uh, Wells I can remember. Papa sold, and then Papa bought half interest in it and worked there a year or two. Was we was farming. Of course, most of our farm actually was, uh, was cattle, uh, grassland. And, and we had two, uh, we had two springs on this, uh, on this farm, one on each side of the house, or uh, from the house. And so, uh, we never had pro problems with water because these springs taken care of plenty for the stock, plenty for the house. We just, the, the spring on the west was only about 200 yards from the house and we carried all our water up the hill out of that spring. My dad took an old chisel and cut right out of a red rock, deep enough, you just go down there and dip your buckets in. And they was full, you didn't have to scrape the bottom. Go to the house with them. The spring still there? I don't really know. I haven't. Uh, I haven't been down to the old farm itself in uh, thirty, forty years. Hmm. Uh, now your grandfather and your father made the run. Well, he homesteaded right out here, where Banner is now. But it was originally cereal, Oklahoma yeah. breakfast cereal. And uh, they changed, I don't know when they changed the name. My two oldest sisters were born in 1901, and, or 1900 and 1901. Uh, on their birth certificates, it shows it, that they was born at Cyril, Oklahoma, which is Banner now. Well, then uh, we went out across there, and he put that, or they did, and they put that, uh, or he had that little grocery store. And... Uh, then the brother was born uh, out out there. Yeah. So uh, then that well, I've only got one. I've only got one sister that that wasn't born at, at Niles outside the two oldest girls. And uh, of course I had a bunch, but they're all gone. See, my folks had uh, nineteen children. Nineteen. Three sets of twins. I, uh, when we when we turned seventy over at Churchway, I always take up collection. Of course, that's just another way of getting a dollar too. Uh, I told him I was forty years old when we turned seventy, and uh, of course I knew the guy that was taking up collection. He's a pretty good clown himself. He calls he calls or did for twenty years, I guess, or more. He calls square dancing. He said, well, I guess that's right. He said, 40 cents is all they put in there. And I said, now, here's a dollar. I said, my twin sister's 100 today. <laughs> Somebody said, she'll get you. And I said, no, she's in California. <laughs> she's not going to get me. <laughs> so your grandfather homesteaded at a banner. At a banner. What you... Where is, okay, how long is Banner is just five, yeah. six miles east of town here, just the north side of, uh, of course, it's about all gone. However, they built a new church out there about three years ago. I don't know how what. How far from uh, Banner is Niles? Oh, uh, Niles is about seven miles east of uh, Hinton. We're just right in the county. See, there's two townships on the west side, I mean, on the south side of the South Canadian River, yeah, and everything else in Canadian County is on the north side. But it's a, uh, of course, the way we had going them days is about nine miles to town. But actually, it's only if the bridge has been in and the, and the section lines open, it would only been about seven miles to town. Well, I, when did your grandfather move from uh, Banner to Niles? My grandfather never did. He stayed. He died at Banner oh, he in did. 1925. Okay. So when did your father move to Niles? Uh, well, it'd have to be between 19 and one. Uh, yeah, 
the second sister's born in 19-1, the brother's born in 19-3, so it had to be between 1 and 3 when they moved out there because he was born, in, he was born March the 29th, 1903. Now, did your father homestead out there? At no, 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 no. He, he had to buy what he got out there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, whenever your grandfather made the run, okay, um, that was in 89. Yes, sir. Okay. How long did, it, did he have to prove up on the land? Well, uh, I don't know how much, I don't know how long he had. I'll tell you something that I didn't know until 56. You, you heard about it, and somebody talked on it here a while back. He gave another version of why it was, a lot of them was called Sooners. Well, my grandfather was already here three weeks ahead to run and had these stakes driven. He just showed up from out of the woods somewhere, but I didn't know that till 1956. So your grandfather was a Sooner? He was a Sooner. What's your grandfather's name? W.E. Niles. William Ebenezer. <laughs> Did he have any trouble being a sooner, or did? No, not a bit in the world. Yeah, as far as I know, he never had any trouble. So he got yeah. away with it. Then. Oh yeah, yeah, he got away with it. No, somebody come there and uh, and was going to stake off for that. He said, "No, not here. I've already got my stakes down." Well, he did. Because <laughs> he put them down two, three weeks early. And uh, so no one ever contested him on a field. He never was contested. Yeah. Oh no. Oh, as I said, I didn't even know that that happened until 56. My dad told me that after my mother passed away. She passed away in, uh, in March of 56. And then I took him several places. Well, had a brother come back from California and hadn't been here in several years. So I asked my dad if he wanted to go with me. I was going over to see his half-brother. No, I said, I don't care about going. I said, well... Robert wants to see him, and I said, whatever hours that my wife don't have to have the car tomorrow to work is when we're going. And when he, uh, uh, when I got ready to go home that evening from over at his house, why, he runs to me like a little kid and said, what time are we going to Yukon tomorrow? <laughs> but now when I asked him, why, he didn't give a damn about saying him, you know. Uh, it, it wasn't important, but just like a little kid, what time are you going? I said, Papa, I don't know. I said, I'll have to check with Gertrude and see what hour she's working. Well, it happened then that she was going to go to work at, the next day. She's going to work the uh, 11.55 to 7.55 a.m. She had. So, hell, I could have the car all day and half the night if I wanted, you know, just so I'd back so she'd go work at, at midnight. How big of a place did your father buy out of Niles? Well, at one time, he had uh, he had uh, half a section and then rented, and then he had some rent ground on top of that mm -hmm. because uh, the Erickson farm, I can remember living on the Erickson farm, and I got an awful good reason for knowing <laughs> Just six to seven years ago, maybe ten, this place quit showing. I went to cut off a piece of stick for a stick horse, like kids rode. And my older sister said, let me do that. I handed her the axe, <laughs> and she, she raised it up, and I tripped over some brush and fell right on a damn chopping block, and she just laid it open. <laughs> and uh, of course now they just I just remember them telling this I, I don't remember it really but they took they had to take me to Banner to, I mean to uh, Hinton to the doctor Dr. Smith and uh, he sewed it up and he said now you come back so and so and we'll take these stitches out he said if you don't cry well he said uh I'll give you some candy. Well, they always give you candy anyway as far as that concerned, but that's just conversation. And they said, when he would taken them stitches out, I sat there, <laughs> gritted my teeth, and when he got the stitches out, I said, where's the candy? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, of course, as I say, I don't remember that. I just, 
I just remember them telling it, telling it on me. How old were you? Well, uh, I couldn't have been over three or four years old because it was well before it was before we moved back to the store the last time, and also uh, when I started school in fall of ni- uh, 1915, well, we lived uh, three quarters of a mile west of Walnut Center, which was a school, and then a mile north. And that's how far we had to walk to uh, to school. <laughs> and <laughs> Miss Mrs. Clark, she, of course, I'd been visiting with her for quite a while. She lived down here at 623 South. Uh, now, this little school building that sits right over there, I don't know whether you can see it for the yeah. fog or not. She went to school in that building. And uh, so in, uh, in 50, no, 66, we all went out to Nile Cemetery for decoration. I went with she and her husband and her brother-in-law. And that was the first time that she knew I started school, same time she did. But the back side of our pasture was the dividing line, and she went to West Walnut, or whatever they called it. They, the nickname was Possum Holler, and what the right name was, I just don't remember. And uh, I said, well, hell, Fern, we started school the same, same year. I went to Walnut Center, and you went over to the place in 1915. And I said, you remember Mr. Hahn dying right there east of you? Oh, yeah, Bill Hahn. Well, I said, uh, they let us all out for to go to the funeral that afternoon. And I said, I remember that. And and who was he? Well, he, he was a man that, well, he had a family and a uh, pretty good friend of my father's. And, uh, of course, he had, uh, he had a long six spell, and when he get, when he'd get out of his head, boy, he'd, uh, he'd cuss and just raise cane about my dad. Well, when he was normal, well, he was the best guy he ever knew. <laughs> so, and of course, they had children, too. I went to see the oldest one of those of his family mm-hmm. in 74 or 75. And I, I went by and said, man, had broke his leg. And uh, when I got through, I knew Clarence lived right close to him, but I didn't know exactly which house. But it's been that many years, and they built up down the east side of town. And I said, Mr. Myers, where does Clarence Hahn live? He said, right there. Well, I went over there, and I said, Clarence? And he said, yeah, well, I hadn't seen him in uh, 40, 50 years. But that was the first place that my brother and I went after we got to El Reno was to go down and see Clarence. Mm-hmm. Well, then when I visited with Clarence in 74 or 5, whichever it was, is after I retired, I know that. Well, I found out that uh, <laughs> he and my brother was the same age and that they'd just been in El Reno since January. Of course, his daddy died in 15, and, but they had just moved to El Reno in January, and we come over here in May. <laughs> Where did they get the name Possum Holler from the school? Well, uh, the truth of it was, the nickname, Yeah. it was a canyon, right, that went right by Possum Holler. And that building sits, or was sitting right in the middle where I-40 goes west there. They they picked it up and set it out of the way instead of crushing it, which is wonderful because we got a souvenir out of it. They thought it was so small it wasn't hard to move. But uh, you could go hunting and go down that creek. Back in them days, they uh, they hunted for game, and uh, if you couldn't get twenty twenty five possum going down that particular creek of a night, you just had a bad night. I don't know why they uh, congregated that much more in that canyon than they did others, but that was a canyon that the water and the, and the, everything must have been just right for them. Mm-hmm. So that's the way it got the nickname Possum Holler. Uh, what kind of house was on the farm when your father bought it? What kind of house did you live in as a child? Uh, the first house that I can remember, now that's that's the last house. The other house was a rent house. 
But the last house, I mean, the first house we moved in there, it was a two-room house with the, we had beds fixed in the attic. There wasn't any upstairs, really, but you went up a ladder to get up there, but that, you had to do something to sleep with seven or eight in the house. <laughs> and uh, then he built a big old uh, two-story house about, uh, oh, 30 or 40 foot square and put a pitch roof on it four ways. Two-story? Two-story building, uh-huh. And you say you mainly had cattle on the farm? Yeah. On the ranch? Oh, yeah, we had... Uh, we had a lot of cattle, and, he, and then he worked for a ranchman, rancher, east of us. And uh, as I said, we grew uh, outside a garden. We grew very little food and feed and stuff because uh, cane and stuff like that to feed them. Why? It didn't take didn't take too much because we we had plenty of water and plenty of uh, of long grass and stuff, and they'd still eat that old dry grass one in the winter time. So, of course, at a time when the weather's bad, well, you had to feed them from, a, from haystacks. Yeah. How many head of cattle did you have? Well, uh, we never, we didn't ha have over, uh, as a general rule, we didn't have over 50, 60 head, but we pastured more. Other, other guys brought them in there and they paid you so much a month per head, and we had two, two and three hundred running there most of the time. But they wasn't ours. Did you raise hogs? No, nope. uh, we had a few hogs, but they never. Uh, my dad never could raise a hog. Did you butcher your own your own cattle? Oh yeah. What time of year did you butcher? All in the fall, the fall. and then the winter. Had old salt pork and stuff. Yeah. Um, how did you preserve the beef after you butchered it? Uh, they let it cure it out, and then they it would. Back in them days, they sawed it down and put them in an old cellar somewhere. And sometimes you'd have to cut the, cut the mildew or something off of it to clean it down to get to it. Of course, it, it formed that kind of stuff with that salt and stuff that they put on them. I don't really know what the mixture was. How do you cure your beef? Well, that's just the way it was cured. I mean, how, you just let it... You, you just hung it up and let it uh, uh, cure out itself. You picked... As a general rule, you picked a damper or a cool day for it to, and it it uh, hung there in halves or quarters for a week, ten days in, in a in a shed that was closed in, but wasn't that wasn't any heat or anything. And then they cut it down or cut it up and uh, and went through the process. How many wagons you have on the farm? How many what? Wagons. Oh, uh, as a general rule, we never had over two or three wagons. Uh, was there much trouble like changing the wagon wheels, maintenance in the wagon? No. How do you, how'd you change a wheel in a wagon? Uh, well, the, they had a lug nut about so big, and the, uh, and normally on them wagons, you had a pin for your uh, uh, double tree, and that 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 pin that, that served as a, to hold the uh, double trees in there, and the single trees works off that. Why uh, that pin was built to fit those lugs, so you could. Uh, Take that out and, and take a wheel off or put it on. Kind of like a lug wrench? Well, just like a lug wrench, only it's just a single, okay. a single thing. And, uh, so how about a jack to jack the wagon and take the wheel off? Never. What, what's a jack? They didn't know what jacks was in them days. How you hold the wagon up? You get your two pieces of uh, a tree, an old lump or something, and pile something up there and lift it with the... Just a lever and a pull. Just a lever and... With bull strength and, and block it then and, and do whatever you had to do to the wagon. Mm -hmm. 
No, uh, we raised a lot of turkeys too, and uh, a lot of time we put sideboards on a wagon and bring 25, 50 turkeys to town at one time to produce out. Of course, when we brought that many, we came to Arena with them because the price was better, and just put a piece of wire over the top, and uh, of course, then they they weighed them, put them away, and paid you, and we started back home. So, um, empty wagon or with groceries that you got while he's over here. With the turkeys in the hoof? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How many turkeys did you raise at a time? Well, uh, it varied, but uh, usually every year we'd have 100, 125 turkeys. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, them old turkey hens could hide their nest, and it was a problem to to find a nest a lot of times. Because if they knew, they're smart enough to know that you was watching them. And maybe they'd fly across the canyon. Well, while you're going down across the canyon get back up there, they've already flew back across the other way. But when they got in that nest, and they always covered their eggs up with leaves, they uncovered them when they went back to lay another egg, they covered them back up, now you just lucky if you just run on to the nest and once in a while a big bull snake would get in there and eat every damn egg. Can you believe it a bull snake could swallow them big turkey eggs whole? Then they'd curl up and and smash them with their own strength or their own body. And that's the way they got the food out of it, but they swallowed them whole. No, I've worked, watched turkeys for 10, 12 hours and maybe get dark and she'd never go to her nest. And the next time, why, well, you'd kind of have an idea about where she's going. Pretty soon you'd find that nest and you'd bring it in and, uh, of course, the, the hens would set on them. But, uh, and hatch them that way, they'd, they'd raise turkeys, but we'd get a hold enough of them or we'd raise them in incubator. You see, it takes a chicken that's only three weeks hatching, but turkey's four. How come? I don't know. That's just nature. Oh, yeah, yeah, the egg. Uh, turkey egg is about like this. You, you've seen too many chicken eggs to, tell you, to know that they don't get that big. Because, well, they're just much bigger. piece fowl, because, you know, the hens will weigh... 12, 14 pounds, and uh, them old uh, gobblers will go 23, 25 pounds if they're getting fed. Are these wild turkeys that you went out and... No, no. Uh, they might have been wild at one time, but uh, no, uh, we kept turkeys the, the year round and fed them. Uh, and then, of course, we'd get red and, I mean, get when we'd sell out, well, we'd save so many for the next year for... To, uh, for eggs and, and your crop. Now, when did you move to El Reno? In May of 1919. I got here one night and I had a niece was born the next day, May the 28th. Oh, I was going to ask you. Remember your, you went to uh, Walnut School? Walnut Center School, two years. What was your teacher's name? Well, one of them was Ruth Rankin, and the other one was May uh, Glenn Tysher, May Tysher. I had to think of her husband's name first before I could think of the last name. And Grandpa Tysher, of course, everybody loved him. Of course, he lived at Huntingwell, and I didn't know where Huntingwell was till about 10 years ago. It's pretty near straight east. It's in Kansas, but it's just over the state line and pretty near straight east of Caldwell. Just a little broad place in the road. What's the name of it? Honeywell, Kansas. Honeywell, Kansas. Mm -hmm. How come you moved to El Reno? Well, uh, we wasn't figuring on staying in El Reno. We were figuring on going back to Arkansas. My dad had been down in Arkansas and worked quite a while. But then when... Uh, when this niece was born, there wasn't any moving. And then he went north for the harvest that summer. 
When he come back, he got this job over here on the railroad, and he worked there till 45. But we were just, we, we was on the South Canadian River three weeks trying to get across the river. Sure. It was out of banks, and uh, we drove down one place where they had a ferry. When they took the last one across, the water got so high that, and we, we camped there on that south side of the South Canadian River for uh, three year, or for three weeks. And then we finally crossed the river right down here where uh, 81 Highway is now, within, within a half a mile of where the bridge sits right now. And went to Banner. Of course, my grandfather lived at Banner, and, and my dad's brother lived a mile north and a quarter east of Banner. What year was that with the big flood on the Canadian? Was that 19 or? Yeah, that 1919. 1919. See, we'd have been, uh, we'd have been through here in uh, February or March if we'd, uh, if we had. you move into town itself, into El Reno? Yeah, 809 East Foreman. That's the first house we ever lived in El Reno. Was there anyone from Niles who went to World War One? Not in our immediate family, no. Uh, Papa was drafted, but he never did go. Uh, war was over, of course, uh, with the cattle, the store, and as many as, as big a family as he had, I think that kept him. The uncle, well, both of them had a, had a problem, but the uncle had a twisted up hand. He got shot hunting one time and had a hand messed up. Well, he didn't ever pass physical, even if they'd got him that day. He might have been arrested. No. See, my brother was born in 1903, and of course the war was over in 1918. Mm -hmm. So, see, uh, he'd, he'd just been 15. He'd been 16 the following March if if it had went on into 19. Do you remember Armistice Day? Oh, yeah. You what bet you, your boots. What did y'all do that day? Uh, well, uh, out there on the party line, I'd been, they just rang, and uh, everybody was out shooting shotguns and, and fireworks. Now, this is, just, this is just hearsay, but they built a, they built a big bonfire up here where the, right in the middle of the street where the First National Bank sits and Oklahoma Tarn Supply, of course, that wasn't there, but there was a funeral home in that part out there. And they said that damn thing was, they had that bound far. They said it was 40 feet high. <laughs> they said it's going to burn down half the town when they were celebrating. And this, that log cabin that sits right there, that was, that was built in 1917 and set up by the old post office. They sold the first Liberty Bonds out of that building right there. It's records on the front of the building. Well, that's a canteen, isn't it? That's a canteen right yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When did you start working for the railroad? Uh, on my birthday. What year? June the 30th, 1916. Or 20, 26, 26, 26.
see, I just worked three summers. Each summer I hired out somewhere else. And, uh, of course, I was going back to school. And then I hired out in train service in 43. Stayed, uh, I hired out in February 43 and uh, then stayed till I turned 65 in June and retired in July, 74. Did you do any work for the railroad before 26? No, not before 26. I was just 17 that day. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I had to be 18 to go to work. Yeah, right. And then the section foreman told me, he said, you was 21. Well, I knew that something happened because that year I didn't have to have a minor's release. The next year, the guy, I had to have a minor's release to go to work. He said, any time I ever hired anybody, he was always 21, because <laughs> I didn't go through all that damn red tape of making out a form and sending it in and getting this back and that. So he said, you may think you're so-and-so, but he said, on my record, <laughs> you was 21 the day you went to work. <laughs> what was it? How big was El Reno when the first one was Oh, they always brag on it being bigger than it was, but I imagine they was five, five thousand, maybe, maybe five fifty. Was the railroad the main business in El Reno? Yes. You see, when we came here, there were two railroads in here. Of course, the old Fort Smith and Western went out. In 1922 or 23, and I meant to bring you a article that you could uh, read. The Fort Smith Western just had enough crews to run one train a day, and whenever the uh, man was sick or wanted to lay off, they called Mr. Thompson, which was an extra man for the Rock Island, and he'd, he'd make the trip to fill in the crew, and that, that all came out in a, in a paper here all 10, 15 years ago, because all them men are gone now. But I'm, I really meant to dig that out and bring it up here with me, and I forgot it. In the 20s, of course, that was, I guess, the roaring 20s, the age of the flappers and all that. There much, there many flappers in El Reno. Well, I suppose there's many, in according to uh, to the size, there was most places. But it happened to be, I happened to be one of them guys that didn't pay the gals any attention for a hell of a long time. And I'll tell you why I didn't have time. How come? Well. My my sisters, I guess, was smart, Alex. <laughs> but they uh, they all married when they were seventeen and got away from it. And for two years, I was going to school five days a week, and I was uh, doing the washing at home on Saturdays and Sundays. We had two sets of twins that were still in diapers. So I had a pretty good job at home. Of course, Papa wouldn't make enough money to hire it done, and Mama wasn't able to do it. How'd you, how'd you do the washing? On a rub board. How'd you? And you, you boil the clothes on the, you know, boiler on the stove, and you had two or three uh, tubs, you wash them through that, and you rinse them through a couple suds or a couple clear tub of water, get all the soap and stuff out of it, and then you hung them on a clothesline. Then you brought them in and fold them when they when they dry. What kind of soap do you use? What kind of soap? Yeah. Uh, crystal white and uh, P and G, and I happen to have some of the the old antique bars at the house right now. <laughs> crystal white. I've been P and G. Well, I've got both at the house right now. And the way I got them, there was an elderly lady passed away out here, and one of her daughters gave me these as a souvenir. <laughs> Why? I what other chores did you do besides the laundry? Well, always had uh, always had chickens and cows too to take care of. 
we we had cattle till after I married my dad had thirteen cows right down there on at eight eleven South Haddon at one time. Uh, he didn't he didn't get out of the cattle business till around thirty around nineteen thirty four, thirty five. He took them out to my brother got on a farm out northwest of Calumet, and he, he finally taken them all out there, and then they finally sold them when the brother left the farm, because he was sharecropping, and my brother-in-law bought the farm, and when he got ready to go to the farm, why, he come back, he came back to Calumet, worked for the county commissioner out there, and uh, they sold the cattle. Town had grown up then, so you wasn't going to keep cattle in that, this part of town, or you had to get out further than that. But they had one old cow right up here, just a half a block from the from the police station, which was getting along. Now, I don't know what how what them two old maids, or how they did it, or whether they taken her to the vet and had her uh, cord cut where she couldn't ball. But they had her right there and milked her for years, and nobody knew that cow was in uh, was in that block. It's where the it's here. It's in the block where the it's in the half block. I'm talking about where the city uh, the first national bank's drive drive-in bank. Well, it's south of that, and just north of where the Goodyear. That's a good year. They over on Rock Island. Well, anyway, that chain store that sits there on the corner of uh, Russell, where the four-way stop sign is. I mean, signal. Uh, they've got voice machine radios and stuff there. Well, it was just north of that. That was a film station at that time on that corner, and uh, and they lived just north of that, and nobody knew that cow was there till they got ready to get rid of it. And they'd had a cow there for years. When I first come to El Reno, I talked about that block right there. There was a little place, oh, there was a confectionery on the corner. There was two little tin buildings that looked just alike. One of them was a shoe shop, and the other one was, uh, oh, what was it? Mr. Lewis was a cob shoe cobbler that lived there. He was a one-legged man. He finally moved to Kingfisher. He had a daughter. He left Evelyn, and I tried to find her here a while back, and I, I got close. The man said, "Mr. Niles, I know her. She went to school to me. She was an old retired school teacher. She married a boy out west, but to save my soul, I can't tell you who she married. And said she'd been in our house a hundred times. You know, before she married." And uh, he said, that I just don't know where she is. Well, she'd have to be in her 70s also. Because we was in the second, third grade yet. And, uh, in the early days when a person died, how long was it for the day? Well, as a general rule, in, unless it was late of the evening, unless they was holding them for somebody that was way out that was going to have trouble getting there, uh, never over 48 hours. And most of the time, if it was early today, they'd have it tomorrow afternoon. They might have it at 4 o'clock, but uh, if they wasn't somebody coming from out of state somewhere, why, uh, they didn't keep that body very long. I was just talk, visiting with an undertaker up here the other day, and I was telling him about apologizing to his dad one time. And I said, you know, I know. Uh, I said, I said to your dad one time, oh, you ain't so damn old. I said, you're just 20 years older than I am. He said, how old do you think I am? I said, you was born in 1889. He said, you're damn sure right. <laughs> he said, when was you born? I said, 1909. <laughs> And I told Boyd, I said, now, I knew your grandfather. 
I was talking to, to your dad, which was Boyd S., and I said, I also knew your grandfather ahead of that. <laughs> and, uh, of course, I said, I just you a kid. That's like this Mr. Evans over here. He's 90. Well, he'll be 93 the 21st this month. Hello there. And he said, uh, I said, now I've known you for 63 years. I know when you knew who I was. But I, go, I promised that I'd go see him every two weeks. And I said, I'll try to make it every week. But I won't go without seeing you every two weeks. And the only thing that the old conductor has got, I broke for him at one time for six or eight months. The only thing that he's still got that's good is a good mind. He can't think of people's names, but when he goes to hunting for them, I'll call the name for him. He said, you're the youngest guy. I said, well, Clarence, we work together. I didn't tell him, but in my own mind, I knew who he liked and who he didn't like. I knew who he was going to talk about, Connie, when he, maybe he'll say a first name and then the other won't come. And I'll finally say, you talk about George Payne, or you talk about, God damn it, yes, how do you know? Where does he live now? <laughs> he lives just about four blocks from here at 819 South, or 829, or Jesus Christ, 529 South uh, Haddon. And then there's an 81-year-old conductor that lives at uh, 500 South Haddon. And then there's a guy three years younger than I am that uh, has had, well, the, the last two now, Mr. White and uh, Frank have both, Frank's had a heart attack or two, and uh, Jim had uh, heart surgery, five bypasses about uh, six years ago. And I go see them regular. <laughs> I was over there the night before last. I was over at Frank's the night before that. Well, I went to Mr. Evans and, and Mr. White the same day. But that, now those three, that's three conductors. And then there's an old engineer. I say old. He's the oldest living engineer. I don't know how old Joe is. And his wife had a stroke here uh, just a month or so ago. I didn't know that till just the other day. She was, a, she was an Orient the first time I saw the ladies and who she was. And of course, that was before I went in train service and wound up making the last trip with him on the road. Of course, he got scared, and he never made another trip on the road. He bit in and switched in and stayed till he retired. What's he, his name, Joe? Joe Howerton. Hmm. And he's an engineer? Yes. And then uh, Stubby Mars, of course, he's not that old. Walter Mars lives down on the east side of town, if you get him on the phone. Now, he, for years, why. Well, he and his dad were both engineers, and his brother, his younger brother, is, uh, as far as I know, is still working in Blue Island, Illinois, but uh, that's a terminal there. And, uh, but Walter retired about two or three years ago, but he was uh, uh, president of the uh, fireman and was in Chicago for five or six years. No. You started working for the railroad in 26. Yes. What did you do for? I worked in Fort Reno sections. It was located out where the old fort, where the old fort used to be. And uh, I just, I just section hand. What does, what does a section hand do? Well, we lay rails. They put in new ties. They. Uh, uh, Raising uh, and uh, they raise and, and tamp ties where there's a low joint or something like that when it gets rough. And uh, it cut weeds and uh, <laughs> whatever had to be done. Anything had to be done. It you you do this or you do that, and and you just put in eighty hours a day. How long did you work at the Fort Reno section? Uh, I quit in September to go back to school the uh, same year. Then I uh, worked for Mr. Hoyt south of town in 27. 
And then the next year, they was uh, had extra gang. And, of course, it was a better deal in 2028 20, uh, because they worked 10 hours a day, a little more money, and uh, from the River Bridge, west end of the El Reno Yard, but now they'll call it north if, you, if they're talking to you. I mean, if they're talking to you, you don't know what the hell they're talking about because everything runs north and south on the railroad. You don't have any east and west. I mean... Uh, it's either north or it's east. There's no west and south as far as they're concerned. Okay. Well, uh, there's certain signals you work by. And uh, when they whistle in a man, you know whether they're whistling you in from north or whether they're whistling you in from south. So you know whether if you're on the east and west line, uh, there's one more whistle for the for. A man that's uh, out west wants to come back, want him to come back in east, flagman, than he is the other way around. And uh, so, he, so he, you're not going to be mistaken if happen to be two trains out here and uh, and a whistle from the wrong direction. You know that he's not wanting you. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's a set of whistles in. The so you, you, yeah, you got a set of whistles. That's like uh, we had a we had a official. And we've had a lot of them like it. He didn't know any more about railroading than, than you did or I did when I, before I started work. And he said, why didn't you hide, a, hide all that guy when you went over that slow order? And the brakeman said, I did. Why, well, he said, you didn't even open the window. Said, well, they had to reach up there and pull a goddamn cord, and the engineer asked him on a, on a steam whistle. And this official didn't even know what they had that damn thing on. <laughs> now, there's a lot of things like that that, that went on. Because it wasn't what you knew for a lot of them official jobs. It was who you knew. Now, you, as a track man, did you have a whistle? No. No. Now, who had the whistle? Uh, your trainmen, your, your uh, engineers, and, your, uh, and of course, uh, that's just on uh, passenger jobs. Now... Uh, of course, later years, while we had radios, they didn't always work, but we had radios on uh, on both ends, the caboose and the, and the head end. But if you see anything bad, you've got a little thing up there, and you can set the damn there from the rear end just the same as that engineer can from the head end. It don't always give you the same results, but you always stop. Because <laughs> you do sometimes, somebody gets excited, and... and uh, if he's had drawn off a little air, you might pull the train into. <laughs> um, of course, there's a lot of bad things about the railroad, but there was a lot of good things too. You know, nothing's all gravy or ice cream. You, so did, did you work as a section man for Mr. Hort too? Yes, sir. And oh, I started to tell you then this 27 when I worked 10 hours a day. Well, they raised, they, they built a new river bridge across the uh, river. The railroad built, built them a new bridge. So then they raised uh, from the river bridge to Concho for the hill. They raised it two feet. That way, uh, when you started up here, you didn't have such a hill to climb because you're on the level ground. And uh, you could take a little more tonnage over the hill. Of course, of course, of course when we, yeah, so when we was doing that, I didn't know what was going on. Yeah, we'd raise it, uh, oh, anywhere from four to six inches, and then we'd tamp it down as we went. And when we got as far as they wanted to go up there, well, then you started back and did the same thing over. But eventually, that year, they got it raised two feet. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, they called that a floating gang or uh or an extra gang, and, uh, but anyway, they worked just 10 hours instead of just the eight, because it was a job that uh, that was contracted, and the money was set aside for it, and the sooner they got it done, why, the sooner they get away from there. Yeah. And, uh, In the 30s, how did the Depression affect El Reno and the railroad? Well, uh... It, 
uh, in the 30s, I guess it got, uh, see, the big part, and a lot of people had killed themselves and jumped out windows and everything else back east before the Depression really got out here. But in the 30s, they was guys cut off here off the railroad that was already promoted to conductors and they couldn't even hold a job breaking. Uh, Mr. German, what started school in 19... Oh, Christ. I want to say 196, but I believe that's wrong. Maybe it's headed of that. No, it wasn't. He started school in 196. Uh, he, was, he was promoted, and they, they, got, they cut down just to him. I mean, yeah, he was a conductor. And they cut down just to him. He was the last man on the extra board, and he finally went to him and said, uh, why don't you cut me off the extra board? I've got a job. I make more money than I make staying on this extra board. So they cut him off. Now, he was a man that asked to be cut off. Well, he said, you, you've got too many men on the board. Well, he had, he had an act in a, in a traveling salesman job. And he'd taken it, and of course, he made more money. Of course, I went to his funeral here about two years ago. And, uh, but he and the Palmer twins out north of town started school the same year. And one of them told me about it after Mr. German was gone. And, uh, of course, I knew, uh, I knew Gail's dad. When, uh, well, his youngest brother and I was in school together. And, uh, and I, I think, the younger brother was already gone before Gail went, but uh, hell, Gail had been retired 25, 30 years when he passed away. Well, he was getting on up there. And, uh, Did you say he was on the uh, extra board? Yeah. What is it? Well, if somebody wanted to lay off, if they've got a man on the extra board available, they'd let him off and use extra men. Uh, in, in, in other words, you're just a standby situation. You're, you're three times out on an extra board, or you're five times out on your own turn, or you could be the other way around. But it kind of give you an idea about when they might need you. But now I went from my house one morning to right down here, which was uh, about five blocks. And when I got back home, I was lost. They... Uh, there wasn't a vacancy when I called the yards. And uh, they called the turn to go south. I was three times out. There wasn't a vacancy. And uh, <laughs> when, when they called this first turn, they called it with a deadhead. And this deadhead crew was going to go out on the branch and do some work. Well, neither one of them wanted to go. So they both laid off. Then they, when they call the next crew, uh, there goes there goes my two men ahead of me. But when they called the crew then to work, somebody was sick in their family and he couldn't go. And when I got back home, I called in to see what it looked like, and he said, "Where in the hell are you going, Ben?" He said, "You got lost." I said, "I went over to the freight house to see if." Uh, so many gallon of paint had, had arrived that I had ordered. Well, he said, you got lost. And I said, well, I got it happened. Best families, I guess. What? So I so I have to go. No, they hold me off till this man gets back that's representing me, and then I mark up ahead of him. That's the penalty for getting lost. You said that they were three times out? Y yeah. What's the, what's I, I, I was three times out. Uh, well, there was uh, there was three men ahead of me. I mean, there was two men ahead of me. I was number three, and they don't have a vacancy. But then, when two men lay off on the first turn, that used the two men ahead of me. Then, when the next man laid off on one of the men had a sickness in his family, and he laid off when he got called because he was taking somebody to the doctor. Why uh, they had to call the man behind me so. There was four men that uh, <laughs> that got out, and yeah, I, I missed a turn. That's what you call getting lost. What's the deadhead proof? 
And that's a crew that uh, uh, they're called to go to a certain place. They're going to work out of that place. They might may, they make a Enid. They may be making a turn to Ponca City out of Enid. They may may be going the other way. Maybe to Warica. They may be going down to pick up a deadhead crew somewhere. That sixteen dollar law caught them. When they get there, well, they they let them off and they come right back to El Reno. But other times you'll go out on a work train and you'll be gone a week at a time. How did the depression affect your job? Well, uh, I'm one of the very lucky ones. Only two weeks during the whole damn depression was I actually out of a job. Then I worked half of that. Because I quit a job and went to California with my mother and youngest sister. But I, I was working in the cafes at that time in hamburger stands. And my God, I could walk into any cafe and go to work or hamburger stand. And uh, so even the two weeks that I didn't have a job, I worked at least half of them. But I'm one of them lucky ones that, and I, I, I maintain it was pure D luck if you could just uh, if, if you just, because you had to be well acquainted, they wouldn't hard you. They knew what you could do, and yeah, we need you. <laughs> well, the guy told me, he said, why one time, of course, he was talking about something else, and he didn't know who, I, or he got the wrong name on something. And uh, he said, well, you got this when you were working on the PWA. And I said, Mr. Musgrove, now, I'm not belittling the PWA because I know there'd have been a lot of men starved to death if it hadn't have been for it. But by God, I'm one guy that never worked on the PWA. All I know about the PWA is what I heard. Because I said, I was lucky enough that I had a job all the way through, and I said, by God, I worked in two blocks of your store most of the time. And I said, I've cooked a hell of a lot of your meat out of your store. Because one place didn't buy anything but must go to meat. And of course, Lester Smoyer came around and said, Bunny, that was my fault. I said, I don't care whose fault it was. I said, after. He made such issue out of it. I said, I knew where the groceries went. I said, by God, he can find out. Because them people's moved. And I'm not going to tell him where they even moved to. Because I said, he, <laughs> he tried to force me into, into buying. Oh, he, well, he, he had a, a collecting agency out of California uh, going to collect that. And I said, no, oh, they ain't going to collect it, but I'll tell you what they will do. I'll get twice what... Uh, But I told my wife one time, if you haven't got the money, well, just don't buy it. Um, of course, I lost my wife. It'd be three, three years in April. Mm -hmm. As I told him, I was 37 the other day. I told a lady uptown, I said, I'm 37. No, I told her husband. I said, I'm 37. My daughter would be 49 next month. <laughs> well, she'd be 49 uh, she said, Dad, I always like to hear you tell what your age is, because I know how much younger I am than you. <laughs> but I said, she'll be 49 next month, but I'm just 37. <laughs> what was your salary during the Depression? How much money did you make? I worked one place, because I was getting all I wanted to eat. Mm -hmm. I was working in a cafe, but I worked one place 12 hours, 5 p.m. to 5 a.m., or 50 cents a night. What 
1932. Is that here in the arena? Yep. What's the name of the place? Uh, White Swan Cafe. It's been gone some time because we changed the name on it myself. I finally, uh, I and uh, the guy that's at, if he's still living, he's at, he was working for the city at uh, Guthrie last time I knew, Ernest Latshaw. And uh, we finally bought this guy out and changed it to Ernie and Bernie's Sandwich Shop. Of course, the bill has been gone uh, oh, since, well, I believe they tore it down before 1940. 1940? Yeah, I believe they tore it down before 1940. Anyway, in the late 30s. But I'd, uh, uh, I, <laughs> but somebody come in there and said, who changed your name to make that rhyme? And I said, nobody. We changed it to Ernie and Vernie's Sandwich Shop. I said, Ernest's name is Ernest Latshaw. And I'm Vernie A. Niles. Van Niles' is son out here, they live in South Haddon, if you want to do a little checking. I said, of course, Ernest folks is, uh, is Enid people. But I said, uh, I didn't, that was one of them times you didn't have to change a name to make it rhyme. <laughs> and, they, you know, some, some people was curious. They just couldn't believe it, that our names could be that near alike. Of course, you can drop that V and have Ernie if you wanted to. December 7th, 1941, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. I was smashing hamburgers at Silver Star Cafe right down Wade Street here. And uh, and when the first racket went off, I didn't know what in the hell and this high school let out and you'd have thought them guys had gone crazy. <laughs> what were they doing? Well, they're just hooping and hollering. I guess part of them was getting ready to go to war as far as that's concerned. Uh, well, I'm sure there was, because one of the boys that I remember seeing him, he come back here a few years later, and I said, uh, hey, Fritz, his dad was hero in World War I. And I said, hey, Fritz, did you get as big a thrill out of that goddamn Navy as you did uh, when you come out of the high school there hooping and hollering? And he said, well, sometimes. But see, he got a ship shot out from under him. Yeah, so I knew damn well that he's going to tell me both sides of the story. <laughs> and that part wasn't going to be that funny. Yeah. It's just like when my brother got hit, uh, my youngest brother. They give him, I believe, he was in the Merchant Marines. Yeah. And I believe that when they got hit, they got so many hundred dollars bonus. And which I didn't know, you know, until this happened. But he said, I'll tell you what. If I hadn't been there, they could have damn sure had my 500. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did you do during World War II? Uh, well, I hard out on the railroad in, uh, in uh, February of 43. Was it track man? No, went train service. What's train service? Uh, I was a brakeman. And that man I was telling him about sitting right over there now, his brother hired out just 20 days ahead of him in train service. <laughs> now, what is train service? Uh, well, uh, well, we went through it, but uh, brakeman in, in passenger or in freight or, uh, of course, extra job, but... Uh, but you all work on a, with the same deal, and in train service, cash, of course, back in the old days, you had an engineer, a fireman, two brakemen, and a conductor. That was a crew. Mm -hmm. Well, they finally got to running run some, well, they run some crews before they shut the job down altogether. They finally run some small crews that only use three men. Hmm. Uh, engineer, a conductor was a combination, and, oh, maybe he had a, no. Yeah, he had a flagman. Yeah, they was three of them on that crew. He had, yeah, he, he had to get out and, uh, and head in, if they had to head in somewhere, and the brakeman 
closed and then the brakeman walked down uh, or go ahead and open and close the switch when they left there. Yeah, they, I don't think they ever got down lower than the three-man crew. Ever have a train derail on you? Do you want to know how many I can remember? Yeah. <laughs> My next question is, how do you put a car back on the track when it derails? Well, the, the, there's some simple ways, and then there's some ways that, uh, that you can work a month to, to satisfy somebody's trying to tell you how to do it, and you never get the damn thing rerailed. But the thing is, if you set the frogs, the you set the frogs, that's the thing that lifts, it, that lifts that car up high enough okay. to the rail to fall off, to slide off on the rail. And you put a little grease on it so when it gets up there, it slips off where you want. But uh, if, if you're in the position, and most of the time you are, if you'll set the frogs so that you can go back on the same way you come off, as a general rule, you, you can re-rail it in half the time. But you couldn't make some of these guys believe that or nothing. They had a, these little old pony trucks on the front of an engine. And I had them on the ground out here at Garber. And I said, where'd that damn thing get off at? I said, right there when you hit the frog. I said, how long you been working at it? In three or four hours? Well, we're supposed to meet them there. And uh, of course they had us tied up. We, we met them all right. I said, I'll tell you what, you take them damn wooden stuff you got around there and them frogs and throw them over there in that creek. Of course, I said, I know what you're going to do. You're going to hang them on back where they belong. And you just back up into that frog and it'll re-rail itself. Now, what is a frog? Well, uh, ever... Every track has got a frog at the end because it's set in here so you can go from one track to another. Is there a switching deal? Or and and you, you, you line your switch up here. Mm -hmm. You line the, uh, I mean, you throw the switch. Well, then you come down here, and this, this frog has got a big spring in it, and you go down the track you want to go down. And... Uh, and when you get through, while well, you line the switch back where it's whichever normal position and go on about your business. And, uh, but every one of them got them, and a guy told me there wasn't a, as a dispatcher one night, I told him that this frog was broken and that uh, on the crossover at North Enid. And he gave me to understand there wasn't no goddamn crossover there. This was telephone conversation. And I said, Mr. Penny, do you know anything about a railroad? Well, I knew him when I was a little boy. He just lived across the alley and down on the corner. Yes, and he said, by God, I know what a frog is. And I said, so do I, because I run over them every day. You're sitting up there in the brick house trying to tell me how to do something. Now, I said, it's all right if they don't throw that frog, frog to go down into inside tracks. Because it'll go the one way. But if you put it over there, you're going to be on the ground. I said, how do you think that you get from North Enid to Billings or you get over in the, in, the, in the yard tracks, which is 11 of them, if there isn't a frog there to go across? Well, God damn it, there's got to be. I said, that's what I've been trying to tell you. But I said, this one is broke. But you can use a side, as a tried track, you can use it. But if anybody starts over to the other side, this bolt's gone, and that thing's going to go, and, and they're going to go with it. You're going to have a derailment. Now, I've seen this. It's a switch on the side of the track if they turn. Is that a frog? Well, the, uh, the switch itself, the frog sits on back there inside. They, can throw the, they throw this switch, and this frog... Head you for the right track that you're heading in for or coming out of. And that, that's the frog. It sits back in there. Some of them are 40, it, it depends on your turnout. Some of them is uh, 40 feet from that switch. Now, uh, these high, high uh, passing track switches, they've got them back as far as 125 feet. Well, you can go out that, that thing at uh, 50 mile an hour. But you try to go out one of these short turns, 
at, at 25 miles an hour and you're all over the ground because it won't make it that fast. It's got, you've got to uh, grade according to your turnout. And uh, the guy said, well, you can tell the, the amount of the turnout if, uh, if you'll just count the tires from the switch points back to them. And the guy said, How, where'd you get that information? I said, you told it to me. And he said, uh, I did. Yes, I said, one night when you were drunk. But I said, uh, well, he said, it's a damn truth, but I didn't know that I told anybody that. Well, I said, you damn sure did. You told me and Andy one night when you were drunk. Of course, we was off duty. And uh, <laughs> we was at the pool hall. <laughs> and he got, to, he got the railroad in the pool hall. And old Andy said, no, by God, that's good information for both of us. Andy was five or six men older on the first daily died of uh, cancer several years ago. But I said, uh, I said, yeah, Andy, I said, you know, a lot of times they tell you something that they don't mean to. They, uh, they want you to think that they're the only one that knows it, but I said, sometimes they'll tell you, and if you'll just watch, you, you find out things. And there was an old conductor, you talking about derailment. And I thought he was going to throw him a ring tail fit because he and I didn't, uh, we got along just like this yeah. from day one. And I rode, uh, I went to make a drop. Engine go down this track and they throw a switch and I'm going to ride it down this other track. And because you can't get a, you can't put an engine even on that track. And I got it, didn't have any. Somebody had disconnected the uh, pin down below, and I didn't have a, didn't have any brake at all. Well, I was still trying to tighten the brake till I got to. Uh, well, what happened? They don't lose this one, and and it would whine, but I just brought it up in the end of the car, and that's where it stopped. The clevis went again in the end of the car, and uh, and the brake shoes are still loose. Well, when I had a chance to get off, I was still trying to help it. And here it is, 11 o'clock at night. And I got down between these two buildings, and I said, hell, if I jump off now, I'm going to jump into something and just throw me right back under the damn car. So I rode it off down the track, and it was sitting just like this. And I crawled down the ladders, <laughs> went back up there, and he said, uh, what happened? And I said, well, we found in the track. He said, yeah, I know. I said, Jack, there's no goddamn handbrake on that. I said, the chain is so long underneath there that I, that I just rolled it up till I got to this clevis. I said, it's again the end of the car and there's no brakes whatsoever. It just come out of the shop and somebody had failed to check this part of it. Well, they said, we'll worry about it tomorrow. Just as nice as could be. The next day, when we come back to Hobart, Oklahoma, we was going to Mangum. The next day, we come back from Hobart. This section foreman had put two rails down, bowled them to the end of this spur track, bowled them down there. We put a chain on it and got over on the other track where you could, uh, where you could take the engine out. Started back, and that son of a gun just walked right up there and. Got right back on track where it belonged. <laughs> and, the old, and Mr. Starr said, Now, my God, don't make a report out of this, because I'll have to answer a dozen letters. I'll take care of all of it. So there's never a report made on it. <laughs> no, I've seen, I've seen boxcars 25, 30 feet in the air. I've seen them stand right on the end before they'd fold up. And I'll see them go like this. Brother, I've been in a bunch of wrecks. And up here at Kingfisher, this Mr. White I'm talking about, I don't mean Kingfisher, Dover. He said, now I'd be lying to you if I didn't have shit in my neck. But he said, when that wheel come off of that car, he said, we was going between 50 and 60 mile an hour and these damn cars started piling up down there at the wreck. And he said, when we finally stopped, the first car ahead of the caboose, and the caboose is the only two left on the rail. Now he 
he said, now you got to do Ain't nobody going to tell you that, the, I mean, if they ain't lying to you, that they wasn't scared. <laughs> How many cars were trained? Uh, well, they had about, uh, they had uh, 80, 90 cars in the train, but this wheel, this wheel broke uh, that, uh, that snapped, that come off, it lost, uh, it lost that, uh, oh, what do you call it, uh, that rim piece uh, that that keeps it between the rail, of course, it bounces up and down. Well, this piece it's going to come back down, seat on. But it, it it had broke off over half of that. It crystallized and and broke off. And when that wheel went there, and he told him that, that that's what it was, and some official said, "Yeah, I've heard that damn story before." Well, Frank said, "I'll tell you what. Why don't you look at this thing of a bit? It was right up when it quit." Here was this car with that wheel was all busted up on top of this pile. He looked up there and said, I'll be goddamn it. And he was so embarrassed, he just walked away. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's going to have to dig it out or something else to prove it to him. Yeah. Frank said, Why don't you look up there? There it is on top of the pile. <laughs> and he couldn't believe it. He, he, he was so embarrassed, he just walked away. Yeah. But no. I don't know. I had. I was leaving El Reno on a train one night and got sideswiped in the yard with the engine, had to take it back to the house. I got another train, another engine. They finally swapped me off. I got another train and other engines and started north. And I dropped a. I dropped the car, a journal broke off at Dover, or Jack, just north of Dover, sidetrack, and went on up and we lost another one, got this back together and we lost, no, coming back home we, we broke one off, had one to snap off uh, within five miles of the other, and uh, and they was down there working on this first one, trying to get put new wheels under it so they could move it. And uh, and uh, one of these official road road foreman uh, down there. And he called somebody on the crew I was on, and his boy said, uh, "Oh, he said, Dad, I think we'll be all right in a little bit." Or pop? No, he said pop. He said, "God damn, if I get a hold of you, I'll pop you." He knew, he knew his son's voice. <laughs> if I get a hold of you, I'll pop you. <laughs> what about VJ Day in El Reno? When World War Two ended. The Japanese surrender. I'm just trying to think where I was on that day. But I'm sure I wasn't at El Reno. That was in what, August or September of 45? 45, yeah. I know I wasn't in El Reno. I, uh, I think I was out on a little old one legged uh, railroad, a uh, spur track, and yeah, they'd been celebrating four or five hours before I even knew it was over. So uh, <laughs> things had kind of calmed down, I guess. But uh, and that's like that's like a railroad track they take up. Somebody told me they take up and so on and so on. I said, huh? They take it up in uh, February. They started taking up in February uh, in '43. Oh, he said, hell, I know better than that. I said, do you? Well, that's where I started my seniority. That was the day that I went to work. I started seniority on the 27th. And I deadheaded me to Lawton, and I went out on the branch of 28th to start taking up the rail. Now I said, I know what railroad track you're talking about because they just taken it up ahead of that. But I never worked that track. I just heard about it. I said, you're talking about the one that, uh, that they took out Lindsay Line from Chickasha to, uh, I guess it went into Lindsay, Oklahoma, connected with Santa Fe over there. 
He studied a little bit and said, yeah, I got it. It was the Lindsay line I was talking about. Well, I said, I never worked the Lindsay line, but I started my seniority on a work train in uh, uh, February 28th was the first day we worked. I said, I did hit it down on the, on the passenger train. They already had the engine and stuff at Lawton. Then we went out on a branch out of Lawton to, uh, to Wichita Falls, Texas, and started back this way. They had already taken the rail up at the part that belonged to the Rock Island at the Y, and that rail was stacked there. Well, then they loaded that rail, and uh, then they pulled back and took the rail up and loaded as we come. And then they could get into the spur and get get rid of this load and get more and go back out or get an empty car and go back out and, re and load it. And then that night you took them all in to to where you was tying up and come out with empties the next day. When you got through, well, you was <coughs> back to Lawton and there wasn't any railroad track left out there. There was three towns on that. Uh, I was talking to my wife's uh, aunt's husband and he knew too much about down around there. And I finally looked at him because I never heard of the boy or until after they got married in New Mexico, and I finally looked at him, and I said, where in the hell was you born? Do you know too much about that uh, Chattanooga and something else down there? He said, I got to live on a farm when I was a kid between the two towns that you just named, <laughs> Wichita Falls, yeah. Wichita Falls and Chattanooga. He said, I live between the two towns. I said, well, I knew you had to be from somewhere close to Texas or Oklahoma or you wouldn't have known that much about a little old country spot, unless your grandparents or something like that lived there. He said, my folks still live in that vicinity. Of course, they're not living now, I'm sure, because uh, oh, we're about the same age, so I wouldn't think that, their folks, that his folks would still be living. Um, what did you do for the railroad after World War II in the 50s? Uh, well, uh, we still had uh, we still had a good business. Uh, of course, the Rock Island, whether you knew it or not, they handle more wheat than any other railroad in the United States. They did. Uh, it it was a straighter belt or a straighter line to a lot of that wheat that was went to Houston to be shipped out. Of course, Enid alone had four or five uh, elevators and big storage places at Enid. And uh, a man started up there with a little teeny elevator. And I can't recall his name now, but he told him before he quit he'd had the biggest elevator in Enid. And he did. And he did. But he started, he bought a little old elevator to start with at Jefferson, Oklahoma. I, don't, I guess it's, they built a new one there while I was railroading, so I suppose it's still there. Use it very little, but uh, of course right now, it'd be only, trucks would be the only thing it would be hauling off right now, I guess. Well, I guess when this bunch went back, they may be moving a little bit of wheat now. But, um. What was your idea from the Korean War? You think we should have gone in there? The well, War? I've heard it pro and con, and uh, from the way they treated the men and things, it was a mistake. It had to be a mistake. But uh, you never know till sometime till it's over what really happened. Just like just like a lot of other things, people. People get blamed for something, or people do something that you say, well, so-and-so did it. Well, maybe maybe ten, 10 years later you find out they didn't have a damn thing to do with it. They didn't even know what was going on. Somebody else done it. But somebody's got to get the blame. And if they can, if somebody's <laughs> screwing up money, well, uh, they're not going to be guilty. <laughs> oh. I... Uh, Sir? When did you get married? My God, I don't remember. I thought I was born married. 
July the uh, 30th, 1932. On, on my mother-in-law's birthday. You mean at home or out on the road? <laughs> I've just got one I can claim. I've got a daughter. How many grandkids? I have one granddaughter and one great-granddaughter. And it's not hard to remember the birthdays. The great-granddaughter was born on her mother's 21st birthday. <laughs> I told her, well, she, she's a little premature, and I told him, I said, well, hell, anybody that had any sense would know how come that happened. Well, how? Well, I've always got a line of BS for anybody. And uh, they said, uh, I said, well, she knew the old man was getting old and feeble. And I'd either get the birthdays uh, crossed up when the date come, or I'd just forget it all together. So she just showed up on her mother's birthday, and that way I, c I couldn't get the dates mixed yeah. up. So if I, if I did for one, I had to for both. <laughs> they said, well, damn it, I knew you'd have a good alibi. <laughs> first moved to El Reno, who was some of the prominent people back in 1990? Well, uh, one of the main uh, real estate men was uh, Mr. Nice Wonder, and uh, of course the, uh, the Wilsons were very popular. Of course I told you they had the funeral home, well they also had a furniture store. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Tom Benson had another funeral home where the Oklahoma Tar and Supply sets here. Tom was an elderly gentleman. And uh, uh, they had some Morrisons around here. Uh, Charlie Morrison was one of them. Uh, he had a brother. All they ever called him was Slim. I couldn't even tell you what his name is. But they. They own property out west, and, uh, and then Mike Leonard. Oh yeah, Mike Leonard hitchhiked into into in Del Reno about that time. Went to work as a dishwasher over here on uh, Barker and uh, Woodson. The cook quit, and he told the told the lady that he could do both his family style meals at the hotel. And uh, she said, "Well, we'll just see." So she gave him a job. He worked there till he went over and put in a restaurant of his own. Well, put in a pool hall. Then he converted into a restaurant. And when the old man died, believe it or not, he had about uh, 10 or 15 uh, sections of land, all of it paid for. Well, what the way he really got his start, now, I, the hitchhiking part was all true. But he had some friends in St. Louis, Missouri that knew he was good as gold.
out there and loaning out here for six. Now that's the way he got his start. Borrowed money out. He bought it for four in St. Louis and was getting six for it or more here. And uh, as I said, you can't believe in how many rent houses he had in El Reno. And he never, he, and apartment houses. And he never fixed a damn thing up. He always turned in so much for depreciation. But by gosh, nobody knows how much the old man was worth. And, and he, had, he had a wife and four children. He put them in business. And then had to take the business over because they, they couldn't handle it. <laughs> he gave me his cafe one time. Where'd they get the tombstones? Who made them? Uh, How'd they make them? Mr. Uh, well, they, they grind them down. Mr. Uh, oh, I want to say Ahern, and that's not right. The county, uh, the secretary of the county election board is one of the, the old man's sons, Arnold, Mr. Arnold. And he started his funeral uh, making tombstones in 1909. And it's been in the family till just last year. He bought the other kids' parts out. And last year, he still got his name on it and he's got a little interest, but another outfit's running it. But he's never, he's never actually worked out there himself. Uh, well, uh, they buy them from various places. Some of them come from back east. A lot of them, a lot of them came from. Uh, you heard about these guys uh, at Granite, shipping at that big mountain. Well, I I have whole pieces in on flat cars that be as half uh, be every bit as big as that. Of course, it wasn't that long. They had to load them with big cranes, maybe be just two or three on them, and they chip them things in two and then dress them down. How they dress them down? Well, uh, they've got machinery and they use uh, pumice stone and uh, and different stuff and water. Of course, they got to keep something to keep that stuff from getting hot, I guess. And uh, <laughs> now, any of these guys would be glad to talk to you on that. Uh, you've got. That one is out here at the end of Macomb Street on Elm, and then you go east a mile, and just around the corner, and there's another uh, tombstone uh, place there that make them, the El Reno uh, uh, tombstone. And uh, he's turned his business over to his children. He and his wife retired here a year or two. Well, they retired short. I'll take it back. It's been about three years, because they had. They was getting ready to retire when I got the stone out there for my wife, and I got it right shortly while I got a combination. I got it for both of them. But I haven't been able to use it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I went out there and got mine. And, uh, of course, my folks was always going to buy one for the kids out here at the arena. But one day, I got two quarters ahead. I went out there and ordered one and set it right in the center and put Van A. Niles' children on it. And I said, now, whenever you tea, whenever you get it set, I said, call me, I'll come out and look at it and give you a check for it. Okay. Well, he called me one night. I uh, heard call the wife. Next morning, we went out there. I let the stone over and went over and gave me a check for it. And then went over and told the folks that it was out there. There wasn't no argument about how it was going to look or what he's going to put on it because it already done. It. You know, they looked at it. They went across there. And I didn't know that till after my mother died. They had him make a duplicate of it and take it out to Nile Cemetery. I've got two brothers, a niece, the niece's grandmother, which would be no relation of mine. It was uh, my brother in law's. Uh, mother and then there's another baby buried there papa told me he said they were financially embarrassed and they said uh, i knew that we wasn't going to use those other graves there we they were paid for and he said i told him just go ahead and bury his baby there because we'd never use them anyway and it wouldn't cost him a dang thing
because the neighbors had dig a grave and said he wasn't able to to buy it, so we said that was easy way out, and he said we weren't going to use it now. Um, well, I guess that's about all I. We had a pretty good interview, I think. <laughs> When does El Reno was settled back to run with? Oh yeah, uh, El Reno. Now I'll I'll tell you a little story about that that you wouldn't even think about Ashton. El Reno, just across the river, is Reno School out there on 81 Highway. Well, they they built El Reno right there on the river. I mean. Uh, Reno, right there on the on the riverbank, they got flooded out, so they moved south, and this school was built out there, and they just called it Reno. Of course, when they moved over here, now whether it was always El Reno or not, I don't know, but the Reno School is out on the other side of the river, but they moved up here on higher ground when they got drowned out, when they were still most of it tents and stuff, and an artist drew a the first school building, and uh, they had it hanging in the courthouse. And I looked at it, and I said, who the hell drawed that? And they said, well, so-and-so. I said, that's not the first school building that was in El Reno. I said, now, he got two pictures crossed. Because that's not the school building. Well, this Gail German I'm talking to you about, and these two Palmer boys, they were twins. They all started at the same time. So I went to the second school building they built down there. It was a, was a little brick building. And the first one that was built down there, they, they, they used the building. Along with that, they used it for filing claims and stuff from the run, and it was covered with tin, and this is the most beautiful building that you ever saw. I, I don't know, I, I know I've seen this building, but to save my soul, I can't think what it belonged to. So I asked these Palmer boys, and they said, my God, no. Well, they was born back in the 80s, and they said, my God, no, that's not, well, I said, I knew it wasn't, just from conversation and, uh, and what I'd seen, uh, from 1919. And I said, that was kind of an old building then and uh, that I went to, and that was the second one. Oh, yeah, I said, we remember when it was brand new because we were still in the grade schools. Of course, I suppose at that time, they probably went close to the eighth grade at that time in, in the grade schools. And because uh, I, oh, I can remember when they changed it to, uh, when they finally put the uh, seventh and eighth grade in uh, in the same building that the high school was. They enlarged it and had them all up there. And then they finally built a junior high school, the second block south where the high school sits. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I was around here when that all taken place. And I worked for the, uh, uh, I was a custodian. I said, it's just a damn janitor. You don't need to dress it up for me. <laughs> and uh, so, Superintendent one day told me he hired Mr. Morris for a uh, uh, janitor. He said, it's the best job he ever had. I said, the best job he ever had? My God, I can remember on payday that he'd have a roll of stuff like this, lettuce, and all he was doing was picking up the garbage and, and trash uptown. Well, he said it was the cleanest job he had. I said, you didn't say that about the cleanest. I said, he was making twice as much money there as he's making now. Because I said, I'll bet you're not paying him over $75 a month. And I said, uh, before, the, before the city took the garbage all in the, away from him and trash, I said, well, I made probably $100 a haul in trash uh, going up and down alleys and picking up trash that uh, people wanted hauling. And uh, I said, I just put... Oh, I was going to ask you. Bootleggers, no reason. 
Well, sir, they had some of the best. And uh, uh, they... Uh, don't have to mention names if you don't want to. No. Uh, well, I, I don't care about mentioning names. Uh, and one of these bootleggers and uh, his buddy, and of course I'm sure that they drank a lot together for that matter, one of them was sneaking out in World War I overseas, and, uh, and the other one was a sentry. And he hollered, Halt, who goes there? And he said, Jack, what the hell are you doing on duty? Why, monk? <laughs> they fell in each other's arms, and he left his post, and they went off together. <laughs> I went to sleep on guard duty one time in the guards, and I heard them coming to change shifts. It was either two o'clock shift or it's three o'clock. And I got up and stumbled, and I run into a bunch of uh, 75 French shells, <laughs> cannon shells. And uh, the officer of the day said, "Was you asleep?" And I said, "No, sir." <laughs> <laughs> well, God dang, when you hit them brass uh, shells, it sound like cowbells that had <laughs> bunch of run together. Well, he knew as well as he asked a question that I was asleep. I said, no, sir. Well, I better not catch you asleep. <laughs> you were in the, in the guards? National Guards. Yeah. Uh, 30, 31, 32. Ever called out any of the... No. No, everything. Who the biggest bootleggers located? Well, uh, down, really, the big bootleggers was down up and down this South Canadian River. And one time, there was a kid standing at our house. Of course, he'd been gone a long time now. And uh, I guess a customer, the bridge was out, I mean, uh, the river's out of banks. He went down there to the river, and I guess this guy was raising cane for a gallon of bootleg. But he went down to the river and swam across the river and got a gallon and swam back across, put his clothes back on, and uh, and delivered it that night. <laughs> and he's either got a brother or a nephew that lives right up the street from me. I've been going to go see him. I know who he is. I mean, he was, if it's a dad, he was at my mother's funeral. Now, I'm not sure whether he made my dad's or not. But I do remember talking to him at my mother's funeral. He and, he and my oldest sister is about the same age. And uh, his name is Eli Brogdon. But I saw in the paper where he lived just a block or so south of me on the same street. And my third grade, no, fourth grade school teacher lives just across the street from up there and I haven't seen her yet. I'll probably mess around and it'll be too late to go see her. But she was Edna Cox from Old Carty. And then she married a businessman here in El Reno that run a clothing store and mostly shoes. We work as shoe store. And, of course, Fred's been gone a long time. Not Fred. Fred was a cousin to him. What the heck was his name? Because their names wasn't the same. And Fred finally wound up. He was a bachelor for years, and he married an old maid that was that taught down here at Old Central School. She was a bone break. Oh, But anyway, we work as the right name. Um, was this bootleg whiskey, did they make it here, moonshine, or was oh. it... No, it was all made in Canyon Run. It was all made on uh, where they cooked. They had one here one time. They was making right downtown here somewhere, cooking it all. Well, uh, the law knew that they, they were making whiskey right here in town, but they couldn't find it. And one day it was snowing like hell. I mean, it was 
it was coming down big flakes and it was laying. It was just cold enough. But here was this spot that there wasn't a bit of snow, just as wet as could be. It went down through there and here was this big thing and the heater and everything going. <laughs> well, that's why, the, <laughs> that's why it, the, it was, that ground was hot enough that it couldn't stay there. It was melting off. And that's the way they caught, caught that one bootleggers. And How did they deliver the whiskey? You're not going to believe part of this, but they they were certain bootleggers here that had uh, 30 or 40 milk bottles, quartz, painted white on the outside, and they delivered it to doors at certain places. Ah. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, that stuff come in by the gallons, by the five gallons. And, uh, made out in canyons. It, well, made in canyons, made in, of course, they got to have a lot of uh, copper tubing and stuff. And uh, like when, uh, like when some grocery store would sell a guy six or seven hundred pounds of sugar. Now, they knew mm -hmm. that uh, something was going on. But knowing that and proving that is two different things, so you got to catch them in the act. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, me being a teetotaler, I don't know nothing about that stuff. A guy, and the man died an alcoholic. But I went over to see him at Yukon. I hadn't seen him in years. And I went in over there and I said, uh, I didn't know this till just recently. Of course, my son in law was born and raised in Yukon. And I told him about going over and seeing R.D. in uh, 56. Well, I knew he and his two brothers had the uh, Chevrolet agency at Yukon. And I walked in there and I said, uh, well, when I worked in Yukon that one summer, why, he and I was working in the same building. There was three compartments of it, but he, they had the film station here and I was in the middle in a, in a big... Uh, Cleaning shop had the big part of it. I walked down there and I said, could you tell me where R.D. Uh, Smith is? Well, he said, uh, I'm R.D. Smith. I said, I don't believe you're the son that I'm looking for. He said, now, God damn you, I know you. But he said, where you been? I said, over there, Reno. Why don't you stop and see me? I said, you over there, you know, selling cars. Yeah, I don't know that you ever stopped at my house to see me. <laughs> well, he said, that's right. Well, I said, R.D., when, when, we, when we leave El Reno or go that way, I said, we're going to Oklahoma City to buy something or to do some shopping or something like that. And I said, the time you put in five or six hours, I said, you don't think about stopping at Yukon and visiting with somebody. You want to get home, feed your belly or do chores or something else. And I said that same way with you. And he said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and then, of course, I told him where he was. Well, they was all drinking up there at the film station one day. And I was working the handlers down there the next door to us. And I guess I was offered a half a dozen drinks, you know. And R.D. was pretty well loaded this day. And he said, uh, they said, well, we'll just pour drink down you. He said, no, by God, you won't. He's got enough sense to not drink it. And he said, you damn sure ain't going to pour one down him. And you know, they just wilted like that. Now, I don't know how much authority he had or how many of them that, that would change mind when he said that. But he was the only man that made an objection. and But they never said any more about it. And this Harold Knox who was a policeman here at that time was in the film station once he moved over there. It, uh, it's where the big bank sets on the southwest corner there to the stop line in Yukon on 66 Highway. Well, I think we have a good interview. It's almost two hours. Okay. <laughs>
Anything else you want to tell me about El Reno or the railroads or well, bootlegging or <laughs> Well, uh, no, I get I get a big bang out of kidding the, kidding the guys or two about their fathers, and I got a postman up here. He'll tell them if. <clears throat> If you want to know anything about my granddad or my great-granddad, you ask him. He knows them better than I did. <laughs> but, but the old man, old Dr. Caddo up here, he was having trouble and his damn feet was about to freeze and the old man told him, said, now, nah, God, I know you know where to get a gallon of whiskey. Can you not? He said, you get it and every night you pour that gallon in a foot pan and soak it for... 30 minutes. And then he said, uh, you can pour it back in that jug and uh, and uh, put the stock in it and put it away. But do that every night. And he said, it'll make that blood circulate and your feet will stay warm all night. And they finally picked him up with this jug and up at the courthouse, <laughs> up at the courthouse, I brought him to trial, and the judge said, uh, well, how do you know it was whiskey? Well, they both admitted they tasted it. Well, I believe the judge already knew the damn answer. But he said, uh, Mr. Hutton, he said, what did you use that whiskey for? He said, I soaked my feet in it every night before I went to bed. <laughs> They threw the court case out of court, of course. <laughs> but they both admitted <laughs> that they they had both admitted that they had tasted it. And the old man had been using the same whiskey for two or three months. <laughs> but he he was bald from way back here the first time I ever knew it. Now, my uncle at home set it out my mother's half brother at home set it out northwest or northeast of El Reno about twelve miles. These two Huttons, uh, uh, the, this kid's great grandfather, lived within just a mile of his boy. They were both fought. And uh, he said one time, I was uh, holding one of the grandkids on my face. And he said he, he, was, he just had a trim. And he said, This kid run his hand back over my head like that. And he come back around, down over my face. He said, Grandpa, you sure got a long face. <laughs> and he just laughed about it. <laughs> no, it was funny to him, you know. And it was funny. You know, guys can get, uh, guys can get, you know, about you kidding about the mustache or the way you wear your hair or, or your ears plop out too much. Well, that's just part of you. And uh, in other words, uh, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, I voted for another person the other day because the man wore a full, full beard. I believe that he'd actually been the better of the two, but I didn't think it was that important. But I like to see a man's face when I talk to him. Somebody said, well, why don't you call me? Well, the truth of the matter is I called you in an emergency. But if I want to talk to you or visit, I, want, I like to see you. Yeah. You know, you can get so much more satisfaction out of seeing somebody. Uh, they can tell you I'm feeling fine. But you can look at them and you know whether they're feeling fine or whether they're just telling you that. The, the giveaway is there. And so there's a lot of times I much better go, i much rather go to the house because I, I actually, I hate talking on the telephone. It, I try to make it a, a short conversation. But the other night I got... Two women called me. I just changed programs because I was going to listen to a 30-minute program. I believe it's a day in court. And uh, those two ladies, I just got hung up when the phone rang again and I answered the other. And she's a widow woman that lost her husband, just across the street from it, lost her husband in June of this year. And of course she hadn't fully got over that and then and she's got cancer herself, so uh, uh, and I respect her a lot. Uh, you know, she was living there when I moved out there, and I've been out there at that house 23 years last December.
Make sure you get in the right box. Oh, how do you, Mr. Ferguson? Hi. And, <laughs> but, no, uh, the, uh, he was a great big man, and of course, somebody said something yesterday. Well, he wasn't lying. His brother told him the truth. <laughs> I got when I was a kid. You didn't have to ag me. You just had to suggest that you wanted to fight, and I was ready. <laughs> and but this big guy was I know six foot two or three. And I walked into the place of business, and he come out of his private office into the. I'd never seen him before. And I looked up at him and I said, Jesus Christ. You know I've got two dogs, but I have them trimmed occasionally. He had a full. <laughs> <laughs> now whether this was a coincidence or whether he hid from me next time he might have started somewhere and forgot about something I'm not going to accuse him of ducking me but I come in the front door again to pay a bill <laughs> and uh, he worked for electric or uh, gas bill in the office but he come out of his office just as I went in the front door he just did it about face, went back in the office, and never come out till after I left. <laughs> but them two girls look at me, because I've known the girls for, uh, well, over 30 years, let's put it that way. And, uh, of course, they're both married. Uh, uh, and I have never actually met either one of their husbands personally. I knew one of them when he was a kid. But he grew away from me, and I've never seen him since. But one of them was a Geary girl, and the other, and, uh, but they're both working at the same job now. And they looked at each other, and I know they wanted to laugh out loud, and they didn't dare to. Next time, next time I went in there, they said, "I God said, you'd say you'd said that to the president if you'd run into it." I said, "It don't make a damn bit of difference if they look that slouchy in them." Now, they was a kid I met over Oklahoma City. He said, he said, Bernie, how you doing? And I said, by God, I'm doing all right. I bet he had on a $200 suit and this full beard like this. I said, now, I know you can't take the damn beard off. You can't take that stuff off, so you're going to have to tell me who you are. <laughs> well, he was the insurance business. And I, we was coming out of the cafeteria, and I asked him, I said, don't you know these guys? No. I said, oh, yeah, you do. Well, then when he told me who he was, I said, I know damn well you do. I said, when you robbed that bank in Oklahoma City, you was with Frank White and Caldwell. They had a bank robbed in Oklahoma City here about 10 or 12 years ago, and the camera was on him. And they'd taken up to Central, and everybody told him, well, yeah, we know him. That's Mike Jennings, lives down in the 30s in El Reno. And the FBI come over here and asked his, asked his mother for him. And uh, She said, well, he isn't here now. And I said, where is he? And she said, well, I don't really know. She said, anything I could tell him? And, no, I said, we just wanted to visit with him. Well, they, they, they finally visited with him. They finally come and got him. They got him in Oklahoma City. And my God, when they found out that they'd pulled a boo-boo, that this wasn't the guy they was looking for at all, they want to know how he wanted to get back to El Reno. They'd fly him back. They'd do any damn way to get him home. <laughs> but uh, his his uncle, uh, his mother's uh, brother, was was breaking partners with me at the time it happened. But, but he was in Caldwell, Kansas with this Frank White the day that he was supposed to rob the bank. No way could he have been in the bank at that time of day. 